Hello, everybody. Is this all right? So, um, welcome to uh, the Morton Kenny Lecture. Uh, we have Professor Christina Walbrecht from University of Notre Dame um, that's here. A uh, little background on this particular talk. So, we originally in, invited uh, Professor Walbrecht to speak here back in 2020, um, and the uh, and the and the goal was to coincide with her book that was coming out which was on women and voters looking at particularly because you're looking at the, the um, centennial of the 19th amendment so perfect timing great topic COVID hits everything shut down so it remember like as so this was supposed to be in march of 2020 and so this goes out next year okay no still can't do it then we're like okay this year we're definitely going to do it and then as we're doing it, we're kind of setting things up early in the semester, Omicron hits, and we're like, okay, maybe not. And so we have, we even schedule on the calendar, end of March, we'll make a, you know, do or don't kind of call. We're like, okay, we're gonna do it. Everything's gonna be fine. Then we get today and the AC goes out in Morris Library. We can't go over there. We have a tornado warnings everything else so I'm not saying the universe doesn't want her to speak here I I am saying that there is a storm shelter over there or an earthquake might hit so I don't know what's gonna happen right but uh, I will also say this is that uh, she's also excited too because I believe if, if I remember what she was saying before she's has other talks that she's had to postpone because of this and we're kind of the, the last one of those series as well um, you know, this, this, this talk is usually have a lot more people who are here, but with the weather and the change and everything else, at this point, just talk. And, and, and we will listen to whatever you have to say. Oh, All right. get comfortable. All yeah, right. yeah, it sounds good. All right. So thank you. Um, oh, I just wanted to recognize John Shaw here, director of the Pub, um, Paul Simon Public Policy Institute, which, which works with us on, on this. And so um, with that, if we could all just welcome Dr. Walbrick. Uh, so thank you. Um, I would usually um, use this time before a talk to get prepared, but Professor Comparato kept me talking until the very last minute. Um, the good news is that I usually go over, but I'll probably have to go to the bathroom sometime in the middle, so uh, maybe I'll be shorter than usual, um, which you'll see is, is very good. And so um, I am actually really pleased to be here. Tobin, I think you were one of the first people to invite me to even do something about suffrage. So the, I, I've written two books on women voters after suffrage. Um, one looked at women voters in the 20s and the 30s and was more sort of an in-depth sort of data and, and sociology book. And then coming into the centennial, um, my collaborator, Kevin Corder, and I um, wrote this book, um, which looks at women voters over a um, hundred year period, and that's what I'm gonna be talking about today. Um, and, and you're exactly right. So I have given more than 30 um, versions of this talk or something like it because of the suffrage centennial. Um, lots of those, of course, turned out to be on Zoom instead of in person. But I'm pretty sure this is the last one. And honestly, it's kind of emotional for me. Like I, really, um, I am not tired of this talk, though, and I love talking about this stuff. So I'm, I'm very excited to be here um, and to be talking to you um, today. And now I'm going to remember what it is that I'm going to talk about. Um, and I'm going to try to go a reasonable point of time. Do you want questions at the end? Yeah. OK, great. All right, so as uh, Professor Grant said, um, uh, 19, 2020 was the 100th anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment, and this is the, the 19th Amendment right here. Um, the right of citizens uh, of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged on account of sex. This is actually the exact same wording as the 15th Amendment. The 15th Amendment says you cannot um, violate the right to vote on the basis of race, ethnic, uh, race, color, or previous condition of servitude. And so this was really on purpose, the idea of sort of expanding voting rights, using this same sort of language, thinking about um, who gets to decide who we will be ruled by. Right, the sort of foundational um, uh, defining characteristic of a democracy, there are many, but the idea of the consent of the governed and that people get to choose um, their own political leaders. And so during the centennial, you heard lots about the women's, the, the suffrage movement and, and all sorts of issues about it. But my research um, really starts the day after the ratification of the, 20th, uh, the 19th Amendment, which is August 26th. Uh, 1920, um, I would be born, because I know you were interested, exactly three days short of 50 years later. Um, 
uh, and that's of course why I study uh, women's suffrage. So now the question was, what would women do, right? So um, the belief that women are so distinct politically that, that they shouldn't be able to vote and they should be treated so much differently was so ingrained and so widespread that it had taken generations of women um, to get the, the right to vote, right? We, we've been a country for more than 200 years. Women have had the right to vote for only 100 years. Um, I hope that sounds sort of shocking to you, sort of in retrospect. Um, but now women were gonna have this right and what was gonna happen. So before I talk about that, I, I do wanna to sort of make the point that what the 19th Amendment says is that you cannot deny someone the right to vote on the basis of sex. It does nothing to get in the way of other reasons you might deny someone the right to vote, including race and ethnicity. So when the 19th Amendment was ratified in 1920, uh, black women in the South um, were of course under Jim Crow and widely unable to vote. I'm gonna talk about that in just a couple of minutes. Chinese women under the Chinese Exclusion Act would not be citizens and would not be able to uh, vote. Native women who kept their um, tribal uh, uh, citizenship would not be able to vote in, in elections. Um, Hispanic women generally did better in the Southwest, um, but there was some struggles there sort of over um, citizenship issues as well. And so um, technically we can say, or we can think that the, the 19th Amendment, you know, doubled the size of the voting electorate, but it's important to sort of talk about what the limits were that to that um, as well. And so that's what I'm going to talk about today. So I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you, um, and so you can nod off uh, later if, if you absolutely want to. And so um, what I want to convince you as we think about um, how women have used the vote since the 19th Amendment, um, and we think about how we have talked about, understood, and studied how women use the vote, um, for the last 100 years, um, I'm gonna try and convince you of two things. The one is the great persistence of stereotypes. So the very same ideas that women are not inherently political, that women care most centrally about their families and their homes, and men with mustaches, that, um, that motherhood is a defining interest for women above all other interests. Those same ideas were used to keep women from the ballot, but as we've talked about, and as women have had the, the ballot for the last 100 years, those stereotypes still shape the way that we think about women voters. There's a reason why we talk about hockey moms and soccer moms, and there's a reason why we think about women's political engagement in particular kinds of ways, even 100 years after uh, the 19th Amendment had been ratified. The other thing I'm going to try to convince you of is that women are, and you can write this down, as diverse in their interests and identities as men are. Um, there is no woman voter, um, although um, the press has been looking for the woman voter and trying to figure out what women voters will do um, since, well, before the 19th Amendment, when women got the right to vote in some Western states earlier on. Um, but there really is no one woman voter. And so one of the things I wanna emphasize in this talk is the diversity of women and what that sort of means for our understanding about gender and elections, okay? Uh, so these are headlines. The Vox Populi puts on the petticoat is the LA Times from uh, 28 down to these are, this is 08 and I think that's 2016, right? Every election, everybody wants to know what's going on with the women, the women. What, what can we expect about women voters? So I'm gonna tell you kind of three things that people have thought about women voters and then talk about sort of how diversity and, and stereotypes sort of help us understand this a little bit better. So the very first conventional wisdom about women voters was that the grand experiment of suffrage was a failure. Um, years ago, someone said this to me, and I've been using it in talks ever since, that basically these would be the Twitter hot takes of 1923 and 1924, but instead of being on Twitter, um, they're on the Washington Post, one of these is Harper's Magazine, The Century, and probably the only academic talk you're going to hear this, this year that has a, a site from Good Housekeeping Magazine. This idea was absolutely widespread. I mean, there's a reason why it's actually a question here in Good Housekeeping, because it's so talked about, that women's suffrage had been a failure. It wasn't just the press that made this presumption about women's suffrage. It was scholars as well. Um, and this is something I did not get to say in the intro class I was in today, so I'm, I'm very happy to say it. This is gonna make this part go longer than usual, but I am Illinois, so I'm gonna talk about this. 
Um, this is a 1924 article by two sociologists in which they looked at patterns of women's voting in, um, in the great state of Illinois and determined that women do not vote for progressives, they didn't turn out, they didn't vote distinctively, they didn't do all the things that women were supposed to do. Why would you write an academic article about Illinois? The problem, and this was what my first book, uh, or our first book about the 20s and 30s was about, is that we don't actually put pink and blue ballots into ballot boxes. And so the actual voting record, with few exceptions, cannot tell us how men and women voted. You can look at registration and turnout, and, and in some places it's recorded in a way that you can tell, if, you know, turnout of women, but, but you can't tell how they voted. The solution to that, the reason that we do know how men and women voted, is of course the introduction of the mass survey, right? But George Gallup doesn't really start doing his work until the 30s. We have a couple of academic surveys, like one of Ann Arbor in 1928, et cetera, but we really don't have good, reliable surveys until the 30s and the 40s. And so there's all this conventional wisdom. If you read textbooks, they will tell you, women got the right to vote, and then they did this. They didn't really turn out to vote, and when they voted, they didn't vote very differently, et cetera. If you track down, as I have, what that textbook is citing and what that's citing, et cetera, you will come to three New York Times stories in which they interviewed a couple of political leaders in upstate New York and this journal article. This journal article looks at uh, uh, elections in 16 and 20, and it looks at Illinois for this reason. States that enfranchise women early could do so a number of different ways. The way that the Constitution at that time of the state of Illinois worked is that it was easiest to enfranchise women for a set of, of offices, but they couldn't enfranchise women for everything. So women could vote after 1913 in Illinois for presidential election, for the big ones, governor, that sort of thing, but not for other elections. This was actually not that uncommon. That's the way it looks in a lot of states. Um, prior to 1920, um, and so in Illinois, as in other states, and now I'm really mad I'm in Illinois, I didn't bring the pictures, I'll send them to you all later, um, was that men and women got separate ballots. What makes Illinois rare throughout the entire United States, it is the one time in clear recorded history that the votes were then recorded separately for men and for women. So, um, this study is mostly about Chicago because the Chicago Daily Tribune published at the ward and precinct level results for men and women voter, how they voted, um, including who they voted for. Because I've seen the poll books, there's literally a list, and it's like, here's the women voters, and three of them voted for this guy for president, and four of them voted for this person, um, etc. My husband and I spent an entire spring break about 20 years ago, driving around to Illinois counties, going to courthouses, asking them to dig their old poll books out of the basement um, and, and find these for it. I can say if there are 101 counties in the great state of Illinois, we could only find them for about 16. Um, the problem with old voting records is actually no one has an incentive or a need to keep them, uh, especially prior to the 1964-65 Voting Rights Act. Um, but we found some. Um, it's really fun. There'll be a poll book that's just a poll book, and then there's a poll book for women, right? There's like the normal voters and then the women. Um, but what that means is that in Illinois, we actually know how women voted in these early elections. What that meant for us is, I'm gonna present you with some results from a lot of different states. We used a fairly complicated statistical model to estimate how men and women voted in these other states. In Illinois, we could take our estimates that were based just on the census and some other things and compare them to what we actually knew. So Illinois was sort of like our proof that because our estimates looked very close to what actually happened in Illinois, we felt comfortable going into a number of other states. That's now getting boring and I don't, we won't talk about that anymore. Um, but, but you're gonna see 10 states, I'm gonna talk about it, and, and that's the reason, and the reason it's that's 10 states is it's very hard to get um, the kind of elect election records we need from the 1920s, and, and those are the ones we got. So the political scientist, as this title, social scientist, excuse me, as the title suggests, agreed that women's suffrage had been a failure, they just said it in fancier words, right? Women's ineffective use of the vote. And so what do we mean when we say women's suffrage had been a failure? Um, this is a quote from a very well-known popular history of the 1920s, and what Mr. Lou Allen says is, um, basically, women got this big accomplishment and they just didn't use it, right? They simply did not turn out to vote, they just weren't very interested in it once they had that. And so the question, the first question, of course, is, is this correct? And so I, 
what this graph is showing you is in the five presidential elections from 1920 to 1936, the turnout of women in purple and the turnout in men in yellow. And what you can see is that in every election, far fewer women turned out to vote than men. Over time, both of them are going up for historically specific reasons. And actually, and this is the story of the 20th century, women's turnout continues to go up at a slightly sharper rate than men's. It will not be until 1980 that women become more likely to turn out in elections than are uh, men, but they, that has been the case now for 42 years. Um, Right, so you look at this and women are below 40% and men are above 70%. That's a huge gap. Clearly most women did not bother to turn out to vote in elections. And this, this idea of failure was very easily accepted because it's very consistent with the way of thinking about women, right? They're not really that naturally interested in politics. They're interested in the men with mustaches. That's what's in a woman's mind. Um, and so it's not like that surprising. Everyone sort of just took it for granted that yeah, it turns out women didn't really particularly want this right. Let's talk about the diversity of women. And the kind of diversity I want to talk about in the 20s and 30s is geographical diversity. Uh, this graph shows turnout in the 1920 presidential election. Uh, once again, women in purple, men in the mustard yellow, in a series of states. Um, I'm going to read them off in case you can't read them, but very quickly. Virginia, Massachusetts, Connecticut, Oklahoma, Minnesota, Kansas, Illinois, Iowa, Missouri, Kentucky, yeah, Missouri and Kentucky, okay. So what I want you to see is that women's turnout varies dramatically, okay. In, here in Virginia, it's less than 10% turned out to vote in the 1920 presidential election of women. Up in Kentucky and in Missouri, more than half of women showed up to vote, despite being told their whole lives that voting is not appropriate for women, but despite never having the opportunity to practice voting, to learn how to vote, any of that sort of stuff, more than half of women in Missouri and Kentucky show up on, on election day in 1920, right? So there are these places in which very few women turned out to vote, and there are these places in which many more women turned out to vote. And the question is, basically, what makes women in Virginia and Massachusetts and Connecticut, where turnout is so low, so different from women in Missouri and Kentucky. So I want to suggest two things, and neither of them were, in a sense, women's fault, right? So the first is that women in Virginia and Connecticut and Massachusetts faced a very different environment when it came to turnout than women in Missouri and Kentucky. In particular, these are all states that use some combination of poll taxes, literacy tests, and long residency requirements. You're probably aware, and know these best, in the Jim Crow South, where they were used very purposely to keep black people from turning out to vote in elections. Um, Southern elections are sort of more than that. There's, you know, basically political scientists don't recognize the South as, as really democratic during this period, and nobody's being very uh, uh, encouraged to vote. But nonetheless, there was these, you know, these very unfair literacy tests, poll taxes, et cetera. Um, I want to point, well, uh, let me say two things about that. There are reasons to believe that these barriers, which in general led to less turnout, right? Turnout in the South is incredibly low during this period, to have a particularly strong impact on women for a couple of reasons. One, if your family can barely afford to pay a poll tax, whose poll tax are you going to pay, the husband's or the wife's, right? And as time goes on and women don't um, vote, those poll taxes accumulate over time, right? So every election that goes by, there's still less of an incentive to, to help the woman in the household vote. Um, it's also the case if you are a new voter and you've never even been to a polling place and filled out a ballot, that to know that you also are going to have to take this literacy test from a hostile you know, election worker, et cetera, is really something that's going to that sort of run you down. There are other ways that this worked against women as well. So in Virginia, for example, we know um, there's a great study of Richmond where um, uh, basically they set up separate registration for women voters. They got so many people showing up that they got a whole bunch more registrants just for the white women and still like one registrant per county for the black women. 
but it's more insidious than that. Then there was long lines of black women waiting to register, and so the newspapers carried stories about, oh my God, look at all these black women who are registering to vote. Good white women have to get out and, and vote in this state and well. So all these ways meant to suppress the black vote were very successful and suppressed black women's vote. Um, in the South. You might be asking what that means for Massachusetts and Connecticut. Um, it gets less press, but those states were doing the exact same things against immigrants um, in these states. In the 1920s, 60% of the population of both Massachusetts and Connecticut was first or second generation immigrant. Um, they were running political machines, they were you know, seen as, as a problem, and so places like Connecticut and Massachusetts also had these sort of restrictions against women. So we can look at those states and we can look at just those that have really restrictive election laws, that's the, the yellow bars, and places that really don't have very many restrictions, that's the purple bars. And then we can look at sort of turnout of women in those places and turnout of men in those places. And what I want you to see is that in both cases, people who live in restrictive Places with restrictive laws are less likely to turn out. It's the effect, the effect is the same on men as it is for women. Men living in restrictive places are less likely to turn out to vote than men living in non-restricted places. But as you can see, the sort of size of the, of the, the, the impact was greater for women than it was for men. And so the biggest turnout gaps we see are in places where women's turnout is so incredibly, incredibly low. The other aspect of state politics that's gonna affect women in the, ninth. oh, this is why this lecture always takes too long. I have to tell you one more story, which is that um, part of the you, long residency requirements, you think, why is that a big deal? Um, right, the part is like, if someone's gotta have the forethought, we know that any sort of registration requirement makes it less likely people are gonna remember and turn out to vote. In four states in the South, the residency requirement that you had to register at least six months or even a year in advance of an election, um, some states had those rules and they called special, Massachusetts is one of them, they called special legislative sessions and they were like, we're gonna make an exception for women and we're gonna have special days when they can register to vote. In four southern states they were like, oh, women have the right to vote now but they missed the chance to register, sorry, we'll see you in 2000, excuse me, in 1924, right? And so despite the 19th Amendment, in four southern states women, the turnout of women was zero actually, <laughs> they're just not states in my sample. All right, the other way that defines the American states, I'm gonna start talking quicker now, that always works, um, is in the kind of party competition we had at the state level in the 1920s. This is a time period that kind of looks like ours, where states are overwhelmingly dominated by one party or the other. In the South, that's gonna mean the segregationist Democratic Party. In the North and in the West, that's going to be Republicans. What we know, is that turnout tends to be lower in non-competitive places, right? And you can imagine why. If I know the Democrats are always gonna win, I barely need to, like, why bother turning out? Like, my vote's not gonna make a difference. Perhaps more importantly, in states where one party dominates over the other, and the South is a perfect example of this, Parties and candidates don't do a lot of campaigning, they don't have a lot of get out the vote efforts, they're not like helping people to the polls because they're gonna win. Like they're, it, it's only when competition is super close that you're like, I need to bring every single voter, right? Make sure people are there on election day. And so we know that in general, in less competitive places, turnout tends to be lower. It turns out that that's even more discouraging um, for women voters. So what this is showing is again, turnout for women on the left and for men on the right. In places that are one party Democratic, that's purple. In places that are one party Republican, that's the um, yellow. And then the green is in places that are actually competitive. So you'll remember that women's turnout was highest in Missouri and Kentucky. In 1920, the presidential election in Kentucky was decided by 0.05% of the vote. It was hugely competitive. If you have a situation like that where the vote is so close, you are not saying to yourself, let's let these sweet Southern bells stay home on election day, right? You are bringing, bring your aunt, bring your mom, bring your wife. We want people to vote um, on election day. And sure enough, women's turnout in those places is much higher than we're going to see in non-competitive places. So here's the point I just wanna make about all that. When we think about one kind of diversity, the diversity of, of literally where you get to vote, right? The women suffrage is a failure story or narrative is literally women's fault. Women chose to not turn out to vote. They fought so hard to get suffrage and now they're not going to use it. 
What I want to suggest to you is it's that, that whether or not women turned out to vote in 1920 depended much more on where they lived than on whether or not they were women. Okay? So the difference between a woman in, the, the likelihood that a woman in Kentucky turns out to vote versus the likelihood that a woman in Virginia turns out to vote is 50 points. Right? The woman in Virginia looks much more like men in Virginia in her turnout than she looks like women in some of these high turnout states. The overall difference between men and women is only about 30 some points, right? There's a bigger difference within women than we're going to see between women and men. That is a theme you're gonna hear from me again and again because women are diverse and different and they have lots of different interests, et cetera. I'm gonna skip that one. Now, one way in which um, uh, women's suffrage was a failure is women didn't turn out to vote. The other way in which uh, Lou Allen and others are going to believe that women's suffrage is a failure, this is the same quote, but he goes on to say, she voted, um, but mostly as the unregenerate men about her did. Um, what Mr. Lou Allen is trying to say is that where's the revolution? Women got the right to vote and pretty much the same parties, the same patterns sort of um, followed over time. This conventional women wisdom became known as the women vote like their husbands sort of conventional wisdom and it, per, it persisted in American politics for a very long time. So this is a headline from Boston in 1920. This is from the Detroit Free Press in 1952. Right? So still this idea that women vote as their husbands tell them how to vote. I want to raise the stereotype point again, that if you believe that women are inherently not that interested in politics, that women's place is in the private sphere and men's is in the public sphere, this idea that if men and women vote the same, the explanation must be that the husband is guiding the wife makes perfect sense. What I want to suggest is it, things might be a little bit more complicated than that as well. So this conventional wisdom had real consequences. So when George Gallup was more or less in, in, uh, in inventing popular polling in the 1930s and 1940s, what he wanted to do politically was understand how people decided how they were gonna vote. Was it their jobs that influenced them? Was it their religion? Was it the, the newspaper articles they read or the stories they heard on the radio? They really needed to ask all these questions about voters to understand you know, what led you to, what predicted that you'd vote Republican or Democratic. In those samples in the 30s and the 40s, the Gallup organization on purpose undersampled women. And the reason was, according to George Gallup, is I don't need to find out how those women process their ideas and their interests because they're just voting the way that their husbands told them to vote, right? So there's no mystery here. Why bother interviewing women? I need to understand the process that men take in a campaign, and then I just know that they're gonna tell their wives um, how to vote. Um, and so this has actually been a problem for people who use historic um, polling data, is you've got to go in and do all these things to fix it, so you've got a representative sample of women. This next slide has a lot of words on it. For the students in the audience, don't ever put this many words on slides. That's, and cer certainly don't read them. Um, but, I, but I'm doing this to make a point. So if you were so lucky as to go to graduate school and study American politics, um, every one of the quotes here comes from a book that is an absolute classic that defined and determined the, how the study of voting in the United States would, would basically happen. Um, and so uh, this is a 1954 book called Voting, uh, even more famous 1960 book called The American Voter. And this bottom is an article that still to this day shapes the study of public opinion in the United States. These are great pieces of work that tell us stuff about voters we had, you know, it's the first systematic study, nationwide samples, told us stuff about voters we had never known before. Super, super valuable. They all agreed that women did not turn out to vote as high rates as men did, even though by the time the American voters written, it's like a 10 point gap was because they're inherently less political. And I don't know if you can read any of these quotes, but they basically are all saying the same thing, that, that women just followed how their husbands told them to vote. So I'll just quote Converse here at the bottom, which I enjoy because his wife had a PhD and ran the polling center, but he still believed that the wife is very likely to follow her husband's opinions. However, imperfectly, she may have absorbed their justifications at a more complex level. Okay, that's sort of the theme. 
Now, these were pioneering social scientists who did this first national surveys of voters and were really you know, going to get beyond talking to a couple of poll workers and a couple of party leaders and really do careful scientific work about voting. So let's look at their evidence for these claims. So I'm going to pick on Berylson, Lazarsfeld, and McPhee. And what I want you to see in this sentence is that they're making a bunch of clear empirical claims. They're saying these are the facts. And the facts are men discuss politics with their wives. That is, they tell them. The claim is men tell their wives how to vote. They do not particularly respect them. Men do not respect their wives. That's an empirical claim. On the side of the wives, there is trust. Women trust their husbands with political information. That's an empirical claim. Um, and on the side of the husbands, there is the need to reply or guide. That husbands see it as their role to guide their wives. So let's talk about the evidence. Um, I'm going to tell you this is, a this is exactly pre-Excel, what tables look like in books. <laughs> um, and the conclusion of this graph is that married women report that they discuss politics within the family more than men do, especially in quiet times. So this is a survey the, on the left was done in June, on the right was done in October, and it basically asks people, in fact, I'll give you the question wording, right? Have you talked politics with anyone recently? And who was the last person you discussed the election with? One of the things they want you to see is that in June, when the campaign's not going on, people talk less about politics than they do in November or October when the campaign is on. But they also want you to see that the vast majority of women say that they report talking to their families, whereas men are less likely to say that. That is an empirical finding from this survey. The claim, however, is that men tell their wives how to vote. That is not this question. Now, is it possible that more women report talking to family members because their husbands are telling them to, how to vote? It is possible. I'm even willing to bet that in a number of households in this period, men told their wives how to vote. I'm willing to bet that happens right now. I just can't tell from this evidence how widespread that practice actually was, right? You're not asking the right question. You're taking this survey and you're interpreting it to mean that men tell their wives how to vote. A good anthropologist would point out that if on average women are more likely to work inside the home and not outside the home during this period, the very likelihood that they would have the opportunity to talk to someone outside their family about politics is going to be lower for women than it is for men, even if they're not being guided or directed at anyone. You just have a smaller social circle when you're not employed outside the home. So what about these other three empirical claims? Um, there's no evidence on this, the, the questions weren't asked. What's happening, of course, is that social scientists are doing what social scientists do every day, is they're looking at data and they're trying to understand what it's telling them. The fancy way we talk about it is a data generation process. What is the process that would produce this finding, that women are more likely to talk to their families? And when we try to understand our data, we, we do so with a basic understanding of human nature, about the way that the world works. And if you're a social scientist in the 1950s, your understanding is a patriarchal family. It's still an understanding that, that the public sphere is more the place for men than for women. And so this is the conclusion that you come to. There were, however, other people suggesting other conclusions at the same time. This is a really detailed, long, long uh, journalism piece on women voters that appeared in the New York Times in I think the 1956. Um, and I'm sure you can't read it, but basically the author says, if married couples tend to vote the same way, and they do, it is because their environment gives them the same orientation rather than because the woman rubber stamps the man's choice. Let me say that a different way. I vote the same as my husband. I will let you infer whether or not he tells me how to vote. To the extent that we, if, if you want to predict someone's vote choice, actually knowing how their spouse voted would be a very, very good way to do that. Because it turns out that people who marry each other tend to share the same values, the same backgrounds, the same educational levels. They might share the same ethnicity, religious tradition. All the things that tell us how people are going to vote tend to be, not always, but tend to be in symphony in families. That was a nice history. Let's, let's, let's talk about some real stuff. So it is easy for me to pick on researchers for the 20s and the 50s and tell you how misguided they were. And if only they had been as 
as, as clearly enlightened as I am, um, surely they would not have made these mistakes over time. Um, that is not at all the conclusion I would want you to take from this talk. The conclusion I want to take to the talk is that all of us who try to understand human nature have to be constantly thinking about the biases and assumptions that are behind the way that we read data, the way that we understand what's happening in the world. So in 2016, I published my first book on women voters. And I'm like, this is my year, man. I got, I got this book out about women voters. We're going to have the first woman nominee. I went to the DNC to see this happen in person. And it turned out that Hillary being a woman was like the 10th most interesting thing and unique thing that happened in 2016, right? Um, but nonetheless, this was a really interesting year for gender politics, right? So one party nominates the first ever woman um, as a presidential nominee, the Democrats with Hillary Clinton. If you had asked any women in politics scholar who you run against the first woman, it would not have been Donald Trump. Um, but the Republicans nominate Donald Trump, right, who um, has been, you know, says publicly pretty offensive things about women, has been credibly accused of, of uh, doing pretty terrible things to women, um, et cetera, as the nominee. Right? And so observers in the press in particular, including really good smart ones who know how to look at data, were like, it is gender gap time, right? We are gonna have an enormous gender gap because clearly with this choice of candidates, all the women are gonna vote for Hillary and the men are probably gonna vote for, for Trump because how could women not vote for the first woman nominee and how could not women not vote against this man who has said and did these very specific things? So to determine whether or not they were right about the largest Clinton gender gap in more than 60 years, that's NPR, the other one is from 538, I just want to briefly give you a little bit of background on the gender gap. So what this graph, which is absolutely impossible for you to read and, and, and it shows, is basically the gender gap from 1952, when we start getting really good surveys, um, through, in, in this case right now, until 2012. Um, and what it's showing is the percent of women voting Democratic minus the percent of men voting Democratic which means when the value is under um, zero, it's actually a period in which women vote more Republican. And in fact, from the time of suffrage through the 1950s, including the 1960 election, women are slightly more likely to vote Republican. I can talk about why. I will point out, as I did in a class this morning, that it's important to note that around the world, women were more likely than men to vote for center-right parties in the decades following women's enfranchisement. So this is a worldwide, um, a pattern. Um, if the number is, or if the value is above zero, this means women are more likely to vote for Democrats than are men, right? And so we get the 60s, none of this is sort of statistically significant, but emerging most clearly in 1980, the year that Ronald Reagan is elected, um, we have this modern gender gap, which also I should say also characterizes the rest of the world right now, where now women are more likely to vote for center-left parties um, than are men, uh, including in the United States, and we get this sort of modern gender gap. So the size of that difference between men and women, and I'm gonna spend a lot of time talking about this in a few minutes, is usually somewhere between five and 10. That's 1996, where for weird reasons we get this huge sort of bump. Um, and it had been about five points in the elections leading up to 2016. So obviously, Trump versus Clinton, right? We're gonna have a giant gender gap. So I want you all to sort of prepare yourselves because I'm gonna show it to you. All right, did you miss it? Okay. There's, that's a nothing burger. There's nothing going on there, right? Um, I can tell you 2020, it even falls yeah, to smaller than that, right? So what is going on? Why is there not a giant gender gap? Well, the press was clear on whose fault this was, right? And, and that the issue was that white women did not vote for Hillary Clinton. That um, they had this opportunity to vote for another woman, they had an opportunity to vote against Donald Trump, and how dare they betray their sex, basically. Um, let me be clear, there's some real important criticisms here, but I want to put that also in sort of um, historical background. So I'll talk more about this in a second, but the first thing to say is that it is in fact the case that in 2016, a majority of white women voted for the Republican candidate. A majority of white women have voted for the Republican candidate in every presidential election since 1952. 
with the exception of 64, which is the Goldwater landslide, and 1996, which is the Clinton re-election. White women vote Republican. Let me talk more about that. And that, of course, brings us back to another point I want to make, which is about the diversity of women as voters. OK, so what am I showing you here? On the left is white voters in 2012. On the right is African American voters in 2012. Women, this is voting Republican. Women are in purple, men are in yellow. That's always the way that the genders break down in this, in this, uh, in this presentation. So I want you to see a couple of things. I want you to see that a majority, more than 50%, and in men's cases, almost 60%, of white men and women voted Republican in 2012. No Donald Trump. This is the year that the most offensive thing that Mitt Romney said is that he had binders full of women, right, against Obama, and a majority of white folks are voting Republican. A very, very small minority of African American folks are voting Democratic. This is pretty much the way things have looked for quite some long time. Okay, so that's the first thing to say, right? The second thing to say is I want you to notice that among both African Americans and whites, there is a gender gap. White men are more likely than white women to vote Republican. We always say it the other way, like it's on women, but here's a little history for you. It's actually mostly about men moving to the Republican Party. Um, among African Americans, women, in fact, the estimate is actually 0% of black women voted Republican in 2012, and black men are a little bit more likely to vote Republican, okay? We see this across education groups. We see it across ethnic groups. We see it across age. There's almost, I'm gonna show you an ex exception, but there's almost no way you can break up the electorate that you don't still get a gender gap. Men and women are the same educational level. Men and women of X, Y, and Z, there's still going to be a slightly greater propensity for men to vote Republican than for women to vote Republican. I want to point out the obvious, however. There is a gender gap, but it's little compared to the racial gap, right? So again, as we saw in the states, white as voters, in terms of their vote choice, white women look much, much more like white men than they look like black women. Because it turns out women are diverse and have different interests and different uh, ideas, et cetera. So I'm going to show you the same data, but for 2016. Hillary is the nominee, Donald Trump is the nominee. I don't see almost any change in that data for whites, right? Like the percentage of white women voting Republican and the percentage of, black, of, of white men running Republican is almost unchanged. All this stuff changes, it stays exactly the same. There is a slight increase in Republican voting in, among African Americans in 2016. I think my friends and colleagues who study this more, more carefully would tell you this is less to do about the attraction of Donald Trump to black voters and more to do with the overwhelming support that President Obama got in 2012 and in 2008 for black voters. And what we're seeing in 2016 is sort of a return to more normal levels of Republican support in the African American community. So, so far I've told you that voters are very different on the basis of, of uh, sex and race, but much more so on race, and that there wasn't a lot of change between 2012 and 2016, this momentous big election. Well, I'm going to complicate that one too. Oh, I'm talking for a long time. I'm almost done. So now we're going to look at white voters, but we're going to divide them a different way. On the left are people who have never earned a college degree. On the right are people who have earned at least a college degree or higher. What I want you to see is that there's still a gender gap. Each group, men are more likely to vote Republican. But on the other hand, those without a college degree are more Republican than those with a college degree, which is a historic change that is very unusual uh, in post-war America. Now we see some movement. Those without a college degree, both men and women, become more likely to vote Republican in 2016. White women without a college degree become so much more Republican that there's no gender gap or a reverse gender gap among whites without a college degree in 2016. They're one of the sort of unusual groups. And the truth is, if you look at the bars, white men without a college degree kind of moved toward Trump. 
but the biggest swing by far is among white women without a college degree. And the way I like to say that is all oh, those New York Times stories talking to working class men in diners should have been talking to the waitresses. Right? That's where the actual movement is among less well-educated whites in 2016. Now let's look at those with a college degree. White men with a college degree became less likely to vote Republican in 2016. But white women without a college degree became much less likely to vote Republican in 2016, right? In that case, the gender gap gets much bigger and the swing among women, like the swing among women without a college, white women without a college degree is bigger, right? It's the movement is all in women in this particular case. Again, because not all women are the same, not all white women are the same. Not all black women are the same. Um, this is a similar, yes, um, the similar graph for um, uh, black voters. And the reason I have this line about minority populations is basically that a big survey of 2,000 randomly selected people does not give you a big enough African American population. And so better surveys oversample minority communities so we can learn more about them. But this particular survey did not. Um, I'm just gonna tell you that the same sort of pattern holds, that we see a bigger move among women. You'll see that black women without a college degree, almost none of them voted Republican in 2012, and now they did in 2016. Um, it looks like the bar gets bigger for women um, over there, but actually the, the second one is, is indistinguishable from zero, as we say. My point is simply this, that to think about women as voters, is to think about our sort of persistent stereotypes about who women are and what motivates their politics, right? An assumption that women would vote for Hillary Clinton assumes that women's gender is the most important determinant of their politics. That I would rather vote for a woman and against this man who said bad things about women than vote with my other interests, my interest as a labor union member, my religious interests, my beliefs about taxation, my beliefs about abortion, my beliefs about healthcare, right? This, we still have this idea that, that women are defined by their gender in ways that we rarely expect that men are, or at least in different ways than we expect that men are. And so to understand women as voters is to recognize that there are important gender differences, and I'd be happy to talk to you at length about why women our men are more Republican and women are, are less, uh, dem uh, women are uh, less Republican. But that masks the great diversity within women. And then secondly to say that, that even today when we think that we've sort of gotten this better, we have to constantly be thinking about how our attitudes and expectations, our stereotypes, our internalized um, whatever, um, are shaping the way that we look at the facts um, that are presented to us. And with that, I will stop talking, and I look forward to your questions. Thirty times. Every time I was like, it's going to be shorter this time. Why? Why would I think that? Like, <laughs> Yell them out. Yes, please. So that's a really great question. So unmarried women, especially unmarried women with children, are the most democratic group of all, of all those sorts of groups. Unmarried men are also more democratic than married men. Being married is conservative, and it just you are more likely to vote Republican if you're married. Um, even controlling for other things that might be associated with marriage and, and not marriage. Um, but yes, the gender gap still that, and if anything, among unmarried men and unmarried women, it's quite large because unmarried women are so distinctively um, uh, democratic. The gender gap among married folks is not huge. Um, um, and on average, married folks are more likely to vote Republican. Let me, I'm sorry, I'm gonna sneeze. I'm gonna say something about why that is. Um, or I'm not. This is why I'm six feet away from you. Um, so why might that be? Um, 
so I'll do a really short discourse on the reasons why we have the gender gap that we do. Um, because the gender gap em emerged so clearly in 1980, and that was also the year that Reagan right, takes on the conservatives and um, takes the Equal Rights Amendment out of the um, Republican platform and adds the first very clearly pro-life um, um, uh, items into the Republican platform, the conventional wisdom, and Nate Silver still talks like this, gender politics scholars, he also won't talk about the gender gap right in general, but God bless him, Nate still talks about this, is that it was basically abortion and women and feminism that led women to become more democratic. Um, and it certainly can sort of look like that when all those events are happening at the same time and when feminists are saying, yeah, you better you know, come on our side or, or women won't vote for you. Um, it, it looks much more likely, and, and this is the point about unmarried women, um, that a lot of the shifts of both, again, initially it was more men becoming more Republican than women becoming more Democratic, have to do with women's specific relationship to the social welfare state, a particularly starting in the 60s and 70s, which is to say two things, right? As the social welfare state is growing, women are, of course, for all sorts of important reasons, more likely to be the beneficiaries. And so one explanation is that women like the social welfare state because most of the programs um, are directed, in our, in our social welfare state, are directed at women. I, I would suggest it's a little bit more complicated than that. It, if you think about the growth of women's employment in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, it is massive especially for white women, because black women and immigrant women had already been working, but it takes place almost entirely in the health, education, um, and social work sectors. Um, women are the school teachers, they're the social workers, they're the nurses, they're all these sorts of things. And so when we talk about union, like men who belong to traditional unions voting democratic, we see that as like a, 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 an interest in their own employment. We somehow miss that with women that they're gonna vote for the party that keeps saying, we'll put more money into healthcare, we'll put more money into schools, we'll put more work money into social work programs, even though very large percentages of women work in, you know, men do too, but work in, in those particular sectors. At the same time as a very smart student in class this morning suggested, it's also a time, of course, which marriage becomes less stable. There's just way more unmarried people today, right? Never married, divorced, et cetera. And for women, what that means is that where 80 years ago I could sort of assume that I'm gonna be married to one person my whole life and they're gonna support me and our interests are the same, right? And, and people still feel that way. Like if something happens bad to the economy that hurts my husband's job, I'm not gonna like that either, right? It's not like our interests are separate. We, we have shared interests. But as women can no longer sort of assume that they'll always be dependent upon a man, even women who never get divorced, it affects who you are as a person, you are more will, you are, there's a reason why more women go to college now and all these sorts of things. Like, I can't just assume someone's gonna keep me in the way in which I have been accustomed, as much as I would like that some days. You know, I, I have to have sort of that for myself and, and that sort of independence is also often given as an explanation for why we see these different patterns for women. I do this to my students also. You ask like a really small question and I just make it into something, something else. I hope I at least answered your question somewhere in there. Any other questions? Come on, you know you want to. Can you just clarify something? Scott, I am here for you. Okay. In 2016, it seemed to me, and you have a slide up there, that, that they should have been talking to the waitresses more than the guys in the diner. And my impression from that election was that they were talking to the women, and they were saying they were Um, was that, that they were saying that because they were intimidated and that once they got in the ballot box they would vote for Clinton. And am I remembering that wrong? No. Or is that the theme? And it seemed like the data was there telling us they were going to vote for Trump. Why did we believe it or were we wrong? Well, I mean, I think first of all, for the chattering classes, the shock of 2016, like people are, how could this happen, period, right? So I think that got in, and, and not, I don't, I don't mean that as a criticism, like, because no one likes Donald Trump. I mean it that Donald Trump 
was initially opposed by his party, had never held political office, like all these characteristics that we associated with, quote, good candidates, the kind of people that are successful in elections, he simply didn't have. So leave beside whatever you might think about his policies, et cetera, he just did not look like, frankly, I don't know why anyone takes classes from me anymore, because in 2015 I was like, Republicans will never nominate this person, right? This, that's just not what parties do, um, but except for when they do, right? Um, so, so I think we got a lot wrong just from our own biases in 2016. So the, this, I thought you were actually talking about a more specific thing, which is there was some reporting in the New York Times, there's actually a documentary that was made about 2016 and women's activism that has women going up to some suburban um, neighborhoods where they claim that they went up to talk about voting for a Democrat and that the woman, basically the husband came behind the wife and was like, we're all voting Republicans here and da 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 da. And that like basically, that, that there were secret Clinton voters, actually, that you know, women couldn't say it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that's, I, did that happen? Almost certainly that happened. But did it happen so much that it's affecting the outcome of the election? That seems really unlikely to me. Why didn't we see the women? Um, I think that the nuances of, of all women not being the same remains hard, I mean, you know, nuances remain hard for the press in general. Um, but to recognize, I mean, I was still, so I, I'll tell this story just because a friend of mine who's a, a, a very wonderful political scientist and studies race, and she and I were on this 2016 panel, and someone was like, you know, how could, doing this thing again, right, which is how could the women vote for Trump, right, which first of all I want to say, if you think Donald Trump is offensive, how insulting are you to all the men? Like, you seem to think there's no surprise that the men would vote for someone that you think is offensive, but women wouldn't. Like, just stop for a minute and think about your assumptions right there about men versus women. Um, and, and so they were like, why did women vote for Trump? And I gave this long talk about, like I just did here, multiple interests and blah, 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 blah. And they turned to my colleague and my colleague said, white supremacy. Which is a way of saying that, that different women have different interests and that some women, the appeal of Donald Trump on racial issues. It's also the case, there's great studies published in the journal that I edit. Um, we think of sexism as a thing that only men have. Sexism is not historically, how sexist you are is not a predictor of how you're gonna vote in a presidential election, but it sure was in 2016. And it turns out lots of women are also have sort of sexist beliefs. Things like women complain too much, they're trying to get things they didn't earn, they falsely accuse men of things. All these sorts of sort of modern versions of sexism are, are distributed amongst women the same as they're distributed against men. So in a weird way, I sort of want to defend women's right to, to vote for anyone they want, including Donald Trump. Like, you're allowed, the, the quote I had from the 30s is, you know, the unregenerate men around, around them did. Like, this was their standard. Men were gonna be the rational voters. Women can at least do that. And so if, if, women, if men are gonna vote for these candidates that some people don't like, why can't women get to do that as well? I appreciate that my last lecture can involve yelling at you, though. That was. <laughs> Scott and I went to grad, <laughs> Professor, we went to graduate school together, so I've been yelling at him for decades now, literally. I won't yell at you if you ask a question, just it's Scott. Yeah. I have a question actually about the 2020 election. Okay. Um, because I, uh, as I taught a class on the 2020 election, one of the uh, incorrect things I, I said was that um, in Congress, you know, there used to be more of a gender gap between men and women uh, back in the, the day, or between women uh, and the Democrats and the Republican Party. Yes. So I'm looking to see if I have this, those slides here, and I don't think I do. Um, so you were absolutely right. Um, historically, um, uh, women were as likely to run for political office as Democrats or as Republicans, and some of the first path-breaking women in elected office were Republicans. Um, uh, Margaret Chase, um, 
a bunch of different women, um, when there were very, very few. And that actually remains true through the 1980s. It starts in 1992 that you get um, more women running as Democrats and more women winning as Democrats, mostly because more women ran. You know, they're like Democrats and Republican women look the same, and it just goes like this, right? And and so even the first year of the woman in 1992 should have been called the year of the Democratic women because overwhelmed there was a historic for then number of women running, but almost all of them were Democrats. Um, that remains true over time, um, and as you said, is 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 a huge difference between the parties. And when you sort of look at their you know pictures of their membership, they look very different in in that particular way. Um, 2018 was legendary for that, right? Another year of the woman, but virtually all of those women ran as Democrats, as you know. You know, candidate emergence is a complicated thing, and we could talk at some length, and people have done really great research on why more women don't run as Republicans. Part of the problem is they face um, a barrier in their own primary um, contest that people do assume that women are more liberal than men, and that works great for Democratic women in their primaries, but it does not work well for Republican women in their primaries, which is probably one of the reasons that some of the most prominent Republicans you know are extreme, Republican women you know are extremely conservative because they frankly have to do more to prove to their primary electorates that they're on the team and that they're gonna you know, sort of do what the team wants. And there, there's really good work about women emerging out of state legislatures, you know, the reason that Republican women don't make the leap up in the way that Democratic women do. You know, Republicans aren't dumb though. They saw that as a huge cost in 2018. And so when I say candidate emergence is complicated, it's not just that women decide to run, it's of course who the parties, you know, support and, and sort of groups. And so there's no question they made a huge effort in 2020 to recruit more women. It's also clear that more and more Republican women in local politics also started saying, hey, there is an opportunity for me here, and I frankly don't want my party to look bad on this particular dimension. So I haven't looked at the numbers in a while. I'm fairly certain there were still more Democratic women candidates in 2020, but, um, but there were record numbers of Republican women. Um, on the, on the inside scoop, I'll say this turned out really, really good for our, my other collaborator, Dave Campbell and I, because we're doing an experiment, and we wanted to be able to say, you can't lie to people in experiments, it kind of sucks. Um, and we wanted to show some people a story that said record numbers of Democrats, and then another story said record numbers of Republican women, and that was true. <laughs> so the Republicans helped us out a little bit, a little bit there. I don't know if that answers your question. I think it was a strategic mood. It, I think that it remains to be seen if there will be follow through in 2022 and 2024, excuse me, 24, no, we haven't had an election yet this year. What is time? I don't really know. Um, 22 and 24, I, I'm also a little bit worried there was some evidence that Republicans ran women in less secure states uh, and districts, so it's not clear to me that there were record numbers of Republican women candidates. I don't think the payoff was as big, although still there are more Republican women in Congress now. See, no yelling. Dr. Grant. Do it. So I love this question. I love it so much. And I'm, but I'm gonna answer it in a slightly different way. And it's gonna be funny because it's gonna bring around to stuff that we were talking about in the car. And I'm gonna answer it this way. So um, less so about women in voting. Um, I'll quote Colleen McConaughey on this, who always says, women vote not as a sisterhood, but as women. Right, so there's this idea that they're all sort of unified together and they vote as women. It's, it's not the sisterhood, it's, it's something different. But I wanna answer your question by talking about other research. So the, the other sort of main major project I have is on women as political role models. And, and whether or not you can think of um, 
you know, I would say um, Elizabeth Warren and her pinky promises with little girls and Hillary Clinton's cracks in the ceiling. We have this very popular idea, and it's not just a popular idea. Political theorists talk about this, that one of the problems women face because of the stereotypes I talked about is that they're not considered, like, appropriate to rule, like the, the theorist Jennifer uh, Jane Mansbridge says, um, they're not considered fit to rule. And so the more women you get into politics, the more that's gonna look normal, right? And, and you hear this, you know, AOC and all these women, and now we've had Kamala Harris, that, that our ideas of leadership in politics are gonna be, are gonna be less gendered, right? And where I'm getting to is, is the more that there are women, the more that they're normal, and the more that those gender stereotypes I just talked about are supposed to go away. So, my colleague and friend Dave Campbell and I have a project. Um, we mostly look at adolescence. We've been doing this for a long time, but we're writing a book right now, and it's literally about this obsolescence, which is that what we have seen in our research is that when women run for office, they do make young girls think that politics is more fair. They do make young girls more interested in being politically active. We saw huge jumps after Geraldine Ferraro was nominated in 1984, after the year woman in 1992, of Girls and especially, but stuff happens for boys too, saying, yeah, I could do this too. Like, this is a normal thing for girls to do. What we have increasingly found in the last couple of years, and what the experiment I was just talking to you about today confirmed, is it's ironic. It's actually the novelty of women. So, for example, when we looked over time, it wasn't how many women run, but it's literally how much the press says, this is a historic number of women. This is a lot of women running, right? Like they did for Geraldine Ferraro, like they did in the Year of the Woman. Um, we even found, and, and think about it this way. If I'm growing up in California and Dianne Feinstein runs for the one millionth time, I am not little girl sitting at home going, this has just blown my mind that a woman could run for the US Senate for a seat that she's held for like three decades, right? But it's when the first woman runs and we're actually able to control for that. Like, so we're gonna treat Dianne Feinstein different than we're gonna treat the first woman who's ever run for Congress in this particular community or whatever it might be. And sure enough, it's those new people that have the impact on behavior that make people go kind of, it, 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 we think of it kind of just as a salience thing. People look around and go, oh yeah, that, that is new. Um, and that's where we see the effect. So I was bragging today that on my break, I had talked to my co-author and we had run this experiment with college students all over the country. And we showed some of them a story, and I was saying that we got good results, so I'm gonna tell you now what the good results are. Some people got a story that said, this woman is, it ran for this you know, office, never held before by women ever, for the first time she's been elected, she'll be the first person to represent, the first woman to represent, blah, blah, blah. Other people got a story that just said, Jane Doe ran for office and, and she won this election, and then other people got, I think, a, a, a boy story. The just describing a woman running for office had no effect on participation, beliefs about politics, et cetera. Reading the story that said it's the first ever woman that's ever run had big effects on participation, et cetera, in that experiment. So in a sense, for good or for ill, right, the more normal women become, the less at least this role model effect's gonna happen. I am not worried, however, in my lifetime that we're gonna so, I'll say it two ways. I'm not worried in my lifetime that there will not be any gender dimensions of politics. And in fact, to people who said, oh, gender's not that really that central, et cetera, I think that the last six to seven years um, have put that to its side. That ideas about masculinity, about a proper role for women, about childcare, about whether women should work and under what sort of conditions are absolutely central to our politics, and I don't expect that to change anytime soon. Plus, I'm retiring in like 20 years, so y'all do whatever you want after that. I'm ready. So what is 
So, I'm sorry, I'm not good. Usually I stalk when I'm teaching. I'm not good at standing behind a podium. Um, so this idea that there are specific women's issues and and so I, I, I should say, so my first book was on how the political parties changed their positions on these things, right? How Democrats became the party of childcare and the ERA and and uh, abortion rights and in Democrat and Republicans became the other party. Um, so there's no question that the, the party the parties are different from each other on those sorts of on, on what we might think of as women's issues, which I mean issues that are either directly, you know, directly directed at women or affect women more like childcare. So that might be breast cancer research, that might be, oh, they had to fix social security because women work in different ways than men do. And you know, I, I can make an argument that every woman issue is a woman's issue, but that, those sorts of issues that you mean. And so when the gender gap first emerged, that was by far the conventional wisdom that women moved to the Democratic Party because they cared about abortion rights, they cared about the Equal Rights Amendment. To their credit, I would say that political scientists debunked that almost immediately. So there are, are classic articles in 1982 and 1983 that show that it is not those issues. And the reason is, this is answering your question, men and women are not that different on their preferences for childcare, on their preferences for the Equal Rights Amendment, on abortion, on sort of you name it. To the extent that they are, uh, abortion would be a pretty example. M men are actually more liberal often. So men are more supportive of um, access to abortion in many cases than are women. Not overwhelming, but there's a difference. Um, and so while it's possible that women prioritize those, those things more highly in their vote choice, it is unlikely that those issues trump the kinds of pocketbook basic issues that we know have been driving voting forever, right? Um, and so it, it's really not that issue. So let me actually answer your question. What are men and women different on? Um, historically, well, at least since the 1960s, um, and this goes into the explanation I just gave, women are more supportive of social welfare type programs, by which I mean they're more likely to favor more spending on education, more spending on health, more spending on projects for the poor, for the aged, for the disabled, et cetera. It is not huge. So I don't want to make, I don't want anybody to have, a, you know, I'm talking like a five, six point gap in these sorts of questions um, that make men and women different. Traditionally, which is to say back in the 50s and the 60s, there was some evidence that women were less tolerant. It probably matters that our dominant measures of tolerance were things like, would you let an atheist teach in your kid's school? Would you let, and, and they're really all sort of, I almost don't want to say, like, would you let a Jew teach in your kid's school? Would you let a gay person, right, were our measures of tolerance. Um, today, uh, women are much more egalitarian in many of their, uh, their issues. They're more supportive of gay rights. Um, they're more su supportive of civil rights, those sorts of things. Again, I don't want to act like the, the differences are huge, but they are there. And then they're a bit more supportive of environmental protections, and that has just emerged in really the last 10 to 15 years. On most other stuff, and, and even then, again, because I want to I want to sort of, I'm up here as a social scientist, but I want to just defend women as just fully human, human beings, which is to say their public opinion looks a lot like men's public opinion, because they live in the same world and go through the same education processes and are just as rational or frankly irrational um, as anybody else. By anybody else, I mean men. Yeah. Uh, this isn't necessarily about voting, it's just kind of more about your. Uh, I'll just talk about anything. Uh, like political role models, but are you seeing like changes in um, kind of like saying that we have any yeah, women as like role models and stuff, vice versa? I'm trying to make a narrower point. So I think when we think about role models, this is part of what this book I'm writing right now is about, is we mean all sorts of crazy things. We mean, I'll see Kamala Harris and I'll run for political office. That's ambition. I see Kamala Harris and I'm more likely to talk about politics with people or um, to write my member of Congress, like these other sorts of standard participation measures. Or I see women running and I think, and we have good evidence this is true, both men and women think, oh, this is a more fair process. This is a more open process. Um, those, those sorts of things. Or I think democracy is good, or you know, whatever, it, representation is working well, et cetera. So some of those things we would expect to see amongst girls, right? When I, and partly because it's girls that are lagging behind. So 
when we're all worried about participation differences, you see role models and you're like, this will help girls catch up. That's less of a concern anymore, but historically the concern was that girls would catch up in terms of political activity. And you, right, so I, oh, I, that changes my mind about what I think is possible for girls. You can see how that's like a girl process. But other things like seeing the system as more fair and equitable, it's not clear that that's something that only should affect girls and boys. There's not a ton of work on that. That's sort of what we're working on right now. Um, I can tell you we, we have a paper on basically if you see women, um, uh, if you see women running, do you think women are capable that having women in office is good? Um, I'll tell you that all the, almost all the movement that, is among Republicans and, and including Republican boys, in part because the Democrats already think that that's a good idea. And we talk about it as room to move, right? There's, there's still some convincing to do. The other thing I would throw out is that um, I'm not doing it, and I don't even know the research very well, but there's good stuff now on sort of this intersectionality solidarity. I mean, like my own white daughters are more excited about the squad than they are about white women in Congress, right? That that that, um, or, or that Demo we know that both Democratic men and Democratic women now um, have actually, a pr like if it's in a primary and you're just sort of doing experiments, they're gonna prefer the woman over the man, right? And, and what they're really trying to signal is not, I like women, but they're trying to signal, I like equality, that's part of my values, that sort of thing. So yes, I'm gonna pick the person of color, and yes, I'm gonna pick the woman, and, and that sort of thing. Thanks. Thanks, 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 Thanks. My pleasure.